华为 Connect 二零一八。出于对演讲者和观众的尊重，请您将手机及其他移动设备调至静音，谢谢。Ladies and gentlemen, the conference will begin in three minutes. Please be seated and kindly mute your mobile devices. Thank you. 各位来宾，我们的大会将在三分钟之后正式开始，请您尽快就座，并将手机和其他移动设备调至静音。感谢您的配合。
Ladies and gentlemen, the conference is about to begin. Please be seated and kindly mute your mobile devices. Thank you. 各位来宾，我们的大会即将开始，请您尽快就座，并将手机及其他移动设备调至静音。谢谢。When life starts, intelligence evolves. Our world expands with our desire to explore. We feel the pace of life, the happiness and passion, love and courage. And those worlds beyond imagination, we will soon enter an intelligent world. Cloud, edge computing, and devices are advancing day by day, working faster, doing more, and with greater efficiency. Intelligence starts in the mind, and is built into the hardware around us. Soon, everything will be connected. Everything will sense. The era of AI is here. Let's work together to bring digital to every person, home, and organization for a fully connected, intelligent world. Activate intelligence. Distinguished guests from around the world, welcome to Huawei Connect 2018. 尊敬的各位来宾，欢迎来到华为 Connect 2018主题大会的现场。Please welcome Mr. Eric Xu for his opening speech. 有请徐直军先生带来大会的开场演讲。新朋友，女士们， Hello, friends and ladies, 先生们， ladies and gentlemen， 我代表华为，热烈欢迎大家来参加华为二零一八全球大会。欢迎大家来到上海，欢迎大家，欢迎大家在上海度过一个快乐的旅程。I hope that you will enjoy your journey here in Shanghai. 二零一四年。In 2014, on behalf of Huawei, I shared our proposition of building a better connected world. As we practice it with customer partners and peers in the industry, ICT industry has changed rapidly. We are now on the verge of an intelligent world. This is a great era. Huawei is determined to make contribution to promote the progress and prosperity of the world. At the end of 2017, Huawei defined its new vision and mission: bring digital to every person, home, organization through a fully connected, intelligent world. In this new vision and mission, we pointed out the key word intelligent. This is why we see. Activate intelligence in this world. So in our minds, in all of our minds, what will be fully connected intelligent world look like? Please enjoy the video. Let's start. We are live. Hello, world. It's called Narvo. Honey, Daniel said learning is fun. Oh, Daddy saw your painting. Yeah, Daddy's black magic will surprise you. Place this order for my son. Order confirmed.
This video shows to us the future world, intelligent and everywhere. To make it happen, we formulated our AI development strategy. Today, I would like to take this opportunity to share with you our AI development strategy and launch products and solutions accordingly. In 1956, at the Dartmouth workshop, artificial intelligence was officially announced. That was 16 years ago. We've seen two winters of AI development. Despite the setbacks, AI has never stopped advancing. In 1979, Intel introduced the first microprocessor. The Moore's law has supported the robust development of ICT industry. If we put the two trajectories together, it will look like this. Advances in AI and ICT are closely related. Academic research findings in engineering advances go hand in hand. We went through two AI because expectations for AI were way beyond what ICT technologies at that time could deliver. The good news is that each winter eventually gave way to spring, marking the beginning for AI. Today we are again find ourselves in the season of one made possible through six decades of commitment and collaboration between academic and industry stakeholders in the last few domains. We need to take these opportunities and make sure we harvest more crops and make sure the time of harvest will last longer and place AI in the equator and make sure it's prosperous and thriving. Unless we properly define this positioning, we can't fully unleash the value of the technology. The same is true for AI technology. Positioning AI in the right way is the foundation for us to understand and apply this technology. Recognize that artificial intelligence is a combination of technology. It's a new general purpose technology, GPT. It's just like we and I in thousands of years ago, the railway, the electricity, in the past and the past, and also the cards, the computer, and the internet. In the book Economic Transformation, General Purpose Technologies and Long Terms, Economic Growth, the author Richard Lipsy thinks that new GPTs are the driving force of sustainable social economics. Economists have observed that by far throughout human history there have been 20 technologies that have been classified as true GPTs. And AI is one of them. The GPT must have multiple pieces across the economy. It must have many spillovers and can be applied across the world. By emphasizing AI as well as a general purpose technology, my goal is to call your attention to how influential and valuable AI is to our future. As a GPT, AI will help us find more efficient solutions to problems we already know how to fix. It will also help us address problems that today we have remained unsolved. So whether or not we can adopt an AI mindset and use AI concepts and technologies to address those issues is a key to whether or not we can stay ahead in the future. In Sai Huawei, our experience shows that AI can replace humans in certain tasks and also automate cost reduction through our production cycles. This is what sets AI apart from run-of-the-mill informatization. It's also the most valuable characteristic of AI. The industry transformation triggered by artificial intelligence will be seen in all industries. That means AI may change all industries. Every one of us needs to ask ourselves, how will AI reshape or even disrupt the industry I'm working in? Going forward, we need to think of new ways to prepare our businesses and industry for change. There are clear signs that AI will change or disrupt a whole host of industries. Intelligent transportation will make traffic way more efficient. Personalized education will deliver efficiency gains for both teachers and students. In healthcare, 
early prevention precision treatment has the potential to increase life expectancy. Real-time translation across the world is going to make communication more efficient. Precision drug trials will cut the cost and time of discovering of new medicine. Telecom network O and M will become more efficient. Autonomous driving and electric cars will bring dramatic changes to the automotive industry. In just the past year since we launched our cloud AI and high AI solutions, we have already seen AI drive unprecedented momentum across all kinds of industries. AI will also change every organization. The several technological revolutions since the 18th century have had a huge impact on organizational structures, processes, and workforce skills. But、uh, AI will change jobs and skills in a way that is quite different from the previous revolutions. Previous revolutions led to huge demand for repetitive routine tasks, such as operating equipment in textile mills and running car and phone assembly lines. AI, in almost all aspects, will greatly boost automation of an organization. This means that there will be much less demand for jobs that handle repetitive and routine tasks. And demand for data science jobs will keep rising, including those for data scientists and data science engineers with basic know-how in data science. The total number of these jobs will be much smaller than the number of jobs that handle repetitive routine tasks. It's likely that organizations will become more diamond-shaped instead of the triangle shape, and with AI systems taking the place of the people at the bottom, where they handle huge volumes of routine tasks. AI trigger change has just begun. Change can mean good news for some and bad news for others, especially when it first starts to emerge. Some people might see AI achieve once unimaginable functions and get very excited. These people will feel a strong urge to drive large-scale AI adoption, and there will also be those who feel anxious about underperforming AI projects or those who worry about the reliability and security of AI applications. These are the ones who will remain uncertain about how to best use AI in the future. If we look at the history of all GPTs, these reactions to AI are just natural. We have just left the first phase. Exploration of AI technology and application takes place on a small scale. Now we are in the second phase. New technology and society are colliding. From a tech perspective, as AI technology continues to advance, more and more issues are emerging. Application-wise, however, AI comes into wider use, and its value sees greater recognition. That said, existing policies, corporate processes, and workforces are built around facilitative social structures that reflect older technologies, such as those in the information and internet areas. The broader social environment is not yet ready for the AI era, so we see some collisions and even conflicts. AI will find itself in a conducive social environment. When that happens, we will step into the third phase of rapid, comprehensive advances in AI adoption and productivity. The fourth phase will be the golden era of AI until a new GPT emerges. Nevertheless, it's important to keep in mind that AI is not a cure-all. No technology can solve all problems. AI can solve some problems, but not all problems. We need to focus on areas where AI can create the most value, not on problems that AI isn't equipped to solve. So, finding the right problem is more important than devising a novel solution. A thousand miles start with one step. Now, let's have a look at where we are today. On the one hand, the large numbers are testament to the brilliant achievements in the industry. In 2017, 20,000 machine learning papers have been released, and the number of AI papers keep up with Moore's law in the past eight years. Object detection outperformed humans. Speech recognition on par with humans. 
translation approaching humans. Over 22 countries have launched AI national plans. In 2018 alone, more than 253 business meetings and academic events happened. In 2017, 1,100 plus new AI startups. 24 billion U.S. dollars AI-related MMAs in 2017, and 14 billion U.S. dollars AI-related VC investments in 2017. Despite these incredible achievements, we have also seen smaller figures that speak to lukewarm AI adoption in its early stages. So far, four percent, only four percent of enterprises have invested in or deployed AI. Only 5% of higher education institutions use AI to augment experience. Only 2% of、uh, customer service operations integrated virtual assistants in 2017. Only 10% of B2C, B2B, B2C apps developed in China include AI in 2018. 4% of consulting and SI services、uh, object,、uh, projects were AI related in 2017. So,、uh, you name it. AI talent now available is only one percent of what is actually needed. So the gaps between stellar scientific achievements and lukewarm adoption are the driving forces that will push an industry forward. So this is a rising rain before the storm comes. It makes us excited about the opportunities. Only proactive change in AI talent and the industry will lead us to our anticipated transformation. Next, I would like to discuss ten important changes we will see in AI technology, talent, and the industry. First. With existing technology, training more complex models often takes days, if not months. Successful innovation only happens after several iterations. Slow model training seriously impedes application innovation. We believe that training should be completed in minutes or even seconds. Second, as is known to all. Computing power is the foundation of AI. Right now, it is a costly and scarce resource. It is not readily available. It is fair to say that growth in computing power is the ultimate driver behind progress in AI. So, lack of readily affordable AI is one of its greatest bottlenecks. We need to provide more abundant and affordable computing power in the future. We should act now to meet this demand. Thirdly, hybrid clouds have become the predominant cloud service model for enterprise use. So right now, AI is deployed mostly in the cloud, only a small proportion at the edge. It has not yet been deeply integrated with various enterprise scenarios. In the future, AI should be pervasive. It should be adaptable to all scenarios, ensuring respect and protection of user priv privacy. Fourthly, algorithms are another driver behind AI development. The majority of existing algorithms we use were invented in the 1980s. As AI comes into wider use, the weaknesses of such algorithms are becoming more apparent. Algorithms of the future should need less data, i.e., being data efficient. They should consume less compute and energy, i.e., being energy efficient. Algorithms must be secure and explainable. Algorithms like these will set the stage for broad-scale AI development. Fifth, at present, AI projects are always labor-intensive, especially in data labeling. That's been a running joke in the industry: no labor, no intelligence. Of course, we also see、uh, the need for more automation in other activities of AI. Moving forward, we must greatly increase AI automation in such activities as data labeling, data collection, feature extraction, model design, and training to achieve automation or semi-automation. Automated AI will do a lot for overall system efficiency. The sixth one. In June 2018. Benjamin Ratchet, an associate professor at UC Berkeley, released a paper with a publishing title.
do CIFR-10 classifiers generalize to CIFR-10? According to the paper, models that perform well with high accuracy in one test set of CIFR-10 perform well in just test sets. Seventh, the accuracy of any given model shouldn't be static. Accuracy changes with data distribution, application environments, and hardware environments. Keeping accuracy numbers within an acceptable scope is necessary for enterprise applications. However, existing model updates are not done in real time. They rely on human input at fixed intervals. It's a semi-open loop system. We believe the models of the future need to be adaptive to changes and updated in real time. This represents a real-time closed-loop system that helps enterprise AI applications continue to operate in an optimal state. Eighth. Every general-purpose technology delivers maximum economic value only when it is combined with other technologies. AI is no exception, but current discussions on AI are more often than not focused entirely on AI, with no mention of other technologies. We need to promote greater synergy between AI and other technologies, such as cloud, IoT, edge computing, blockchain, big data, and database, to fully unleash the value of AI. Ninth, at present, AI is a job that can only be done by highly skilled experts. There are not enough mature, stable, and extensive automation tools. Producing AI models is a complex work that takes a lot of time and effort. Moving forward, we need a one-stop platform that provides the necessary automation tools, making it easier and faster to develop AI apps. When this platform is in place, AI will become a basic skill of all application developers, even all ICT workers. The tenth one. Lack of AI experts, especially data scientists, has long been seen as a major obstacle to AI progress. Data scientists are scarce and will remain so in the future. Addressing this challenge requires an AI mindset. That means providing intelligent, automated, and easy-to-use AI platforms, tools, services, and training and education programs to foster a huge number of data science engineers. These people must be equipped with the ability to deal with massive volumes of basic data science tasks. The AI workforce will work in a terraced structure with a large number of data science engineers working with data scientists and subject matter experts. This is how we can help resolve the scarcity of AI experts. These ten changes do not represent the full picture of AI technology, talent, and industry development. But if we can drive these changes, it will lay a solid foundation for future AI growth. They are what Huawei expects to see in the AI industry. To drive these ten changes, our AI strategy includes the following priorities. We hope that our products and solutions will help us facilitate the ten changes. Now I'm going to elaborate on our AI development strategy. It's composed of five parts. Firstly, invest in AI research, develop fundamental capabilities for data and power efficient to ensure data efficiency and energy efficiency, meaning that it will need less data computing and power to make sure that it's secure, trusted, and automated. Secondly. Building a、uh, full stack or scenario solution to provide abundant and affordable compute resources. It's、uh, one week equipped with high computing performance. Next, open ecosystem and talent development. We will collaborate widely with global academia, industries, and partners to, to develop AI talent. Next one, strengthen. Existing portfolio, bring an AI mindset and techniques into existing products and solutions to create a greater value and enhance competitive strengths. Last but not the least, will drive operational efficiency. That means to apply AI to massive volumes of routine business activities for better efficiency and quality. Next, I will talk more about the second point. Uh, while the others will be 
talked about by my colleagues over the three days. At the Global Analyst Summit in April 2018, we、uh, had a preview of the full stack or scenario solution. And today, on behalf of Huawei, I'm about to officially launch Huawei's full stack or scenario AI solution. Let's have a look at the screen. Everything the future has in store, or are we only seeing the tip of the iceberg? How can we coexist with machines? Will everything become thinking and conscious in the end? This is the beginning of the AI era. Are you ready? We've talked about the full stack or scenario AI portfolio, and with that, we actually talk about the application scenarios in the everywhere, including the IoT and cloud. And we talk about full stack that include the chipset, chipsets, enablement, hardware. Training inference framework. It is a full stack AI portfolio. We have our Ascent chipset. It's based on the unified scalable architecture, including Max Mini Light, Tiny, Nano, altogether five series. And we also have the CAN, computer architecture for the neural network, a chip operator library, and highly automated automated development toolkit. We also have Mindsball, a unified training and inference framework for device, edge, and cloud. The fourth one is the full pipeline service model art, hierarchical API, and pre-integrated solutions. My colleague Mr. Dang Wenxuan. Will introduce them to you in greater detail. In October 2018, we've launched High AI. It's our AI engine, and in last year's HC, we also launched the enterprise-based AI platform. This time, we also launched the full-stack or scenario AI. Portfolio. It will be a strong support for what we launched earlier. Based on this AI portfolio, Huawei Cloud AI will provide to enterprises and other organizations a AI full stack solution. High AI service are deployed on Huawei Cloud AI. There have been hearsays that Huawei is developing AI chips. It's true. Today, we would like to introduce you to two of them. The first is the Ascent 910 chip. It belongs to our Ascent Max series. 
its computing power in high position. At PE16, it's 256 teraflops. It has the world's greatest computing density in a single chip, with computing power that is more than double that of its closest rival, the NVV100 chip. A Sen 910 will be available for commercial use in the second quarter of uh, next year. On the basis of a Sen 910, we are creating the world's largest distributed training system. It's called Ascent Cluster. It's built with 1,024 Ascent 910 chips. This cluster can support 256 petaflops of pure AI computing power, allowing you to train models at unprecedented speeds, no matter how complicated it is. So when I talk about 10 changes, we would like to achieve this. Our goal of enabling training in minutes or even seconds. This end cluster will be available on our Holly Cloud in the second quarter of also next year. Now let's move on to the second chip, the Ascent 310. Here it is. This is Ascent 310. AI SOC. It belongs to the Ascent Mini series with a maximum power of 8 watts. It supports 16 teraops in the integer position. It also includes a 16-channel FHD video decoder. It's the ones with the greatest computing power for edge computing. In 2019, the other three IP series of Ascent, including Light, Tiny, and Nano, will be used inside uh, our smartphones, smart accessories, smart watches, and IoT. We release more information about their specifications. The Ascent AI IPN chip series provides uh, optimal teraops per watt across all scenarios. It is the world's first AI IPN chip series that serves all scenarios. They deliver excellent performance per watt in every scenario, whether it's minimum energy consumption or maximum computing power in data centers. Their unified architecture makes it easy to deploy, migrate, interconnect AI applications across different scenarios. The Ascent series will no doubt speed up AI adoption in all industries and realize inclusive AI. Huawei will also provide multiple hardware products and appliances powered by the Zen 310, including AI Acceleration Module Atlas 200, AI Acceleration Card Atlas 300, Atlas 500 AI Edge Station, and also the AI Appliance Atlas 800 for one-stop private cloud solution, and also for autonomous driving NDC 600s uh, for mobile data center. We share uh, more information on these products and solutions tomorrow. Huawei Cloud EI will also provide public cloud services with our Ascent 310 and 910 chips, including first generation uh, universal inference sites and also inference virtual machine instance with different specifications, and also the one with bare metal instance. Uh, our colleagues will share more with you tomorrow. To sum up, our AI strategy is to invest in basic research and talent development, build a full-stack, all-scenario AI portfolio, and foster an open global ecosystem. Within Huawei, we continue to explore to improve management and efficiency, 
In the telecom sector, we aim to adopt softcom AI to make network ONM more efficient. Huawei Cloud EI public cloud service and Fusion My private cloud solution, we provide abundant and affordable computing power for all organizations, especially business and government, to help them use AI with greater ease. Our portfolio will also include AI acceleration car, AI server, AI appliance, and many other products. We've been emphasizing full stack or scenario portfolio. All scenario means Huawei is capable to make AI pervasive. In the end, we will be able to build a fully connected intelligent world. Full stack means we are capable to provide to developers strong computing power and application development platform. It also means we are able to provide to you affordable, easy to use, and secure AI to realize inclusive AI. That is at the end of my speech. I would like to invite Chief Strategy Architect, Mr. Dan Wenshan, to introduce to you our full stack He's going to speak in English. Thank you, well. Mr. Eric Xu. Now, please welcome Mr. Dan Wenshan. Listen to me, the details of our full stack all scenario solutions, which is a pure technology topic. Thank you for your time. First, uh, first let's take a, a quick review what the full stack all scenario solution looks like. As Eric just mentioned, it, it includes four layers layers of chip, chip enablement. AI framework and application enablement. I will go through all these four layers one by one. First, let's start with the chip side layers. At the beginning, the first question came to us is uh, what kind of chip set we should develop? What's important to our customers? Because the different customers should have their own right their own way to use AI differently. And for us, the different applications of different organizations may prefer a different deployment scenario, all scenarios. So we believe that each scenario is unique. And all scenarios, all deployment scenarios by different companies or organizations are equally important. So we define our goal, and we believe we should be able to develop such a kind of chipset that it can provide optimum performance, but with minimal cost at all scenarios. That's our goal. Well, it's not an easy job. As you can see from the, from the table list here, we just show a few application examples of AI for different scenarios. As you can see from the table, say, if you look at the computer capacity, it, it may marry from 20, 20 meg ops to 200 T ops for the cloud and 20 meg ops for the earphone. This is 10 million times of different. And if you look at the power budget, which is also important, it can be as small as just one milliwatt. It also can be more than 200 watts for cloud application, or even higher. And if you look at the, the model size, sometimes for earphone it can be as small as 10 kilobytes. While for cloud application, even 300 megabytes is acceptable, or even higher. Again, it's, it's 20 or 30,000 times different. There is also a, more than 100 times different of latency requirements. For AI, there are two functions, training and inference. Refer to training and inference, 
it's easy to agree that inference will happen everywhere at any scenario. But people may argue whether training is needed in those scenarios other than cloud and edge. Our point is yes, because we define the customer privacy protection as the highest priority. Whenever there is a customer privacy concern, the local learning is needed. To cope with this huge dynamic range, huge difference requirements, we prepared a series of IP and chipset, all the way from Ascend, Nano, Tiny, Light, Mini, and Max. Okay. This, the series of chip and IP design doesn't necessarily mean a multiple architecture design. But whether go for a unified architecture is a critical decision to make because the benefits of a unified architecture is quite clear. The developers only need to develop the operators for one time, and those uh, developers can have enjoyable, consistent development and debugging experience. And, the, and then the, the applications you developed for one scenario can be migrated to another, another series, uh, scenario seamlessly. It's a fantastic. But the challenges because of this unified architecture are also unprecedented. First, you need to have a high compute scalability. You may have two options. One is scale out. That means you design an architecture optimized for the smallest computer scenario and rely on stacking up to meet the biggest computer scenario. With that approach, we found the unacceptable power dissipation in the chip area will be unavoidable. Well, there is a second option, a skill-in approach, which means you may design your architecture optimized for the biggest computer scenario and meet the smallest scenario with a fine partition. If with that approach, then you need to be ready, you need to be ready for the very compli uh, complicated task scheduling in software design. And for memory, both the huge difference on bandwidth, memory bandwidth, and also latency asks always being well aligned with varied computing power adapted to different scenarios. And also on chip and inner chip interconnections have also to face the chip area and the power dissipation constraints. What's our choice? Backed by years of successful chip design and unparalleled customer understanding, we go for unified architecture. The unified Da Vinci architecture, as we named. Our scalable compute Scalable memory and scalable interconnection are the top three set of technologies that we developed make this architecture unification possible. To have a high scalable compute capability, we first designed a scalable cube as the ultra high speed matrix calculation unit. With this maximum configuration, 16 by 16 by 16, one cube can complete 4,096 max operations within one clock cycle. Within one clock cycle, that's it. Okay. Uh, with more, impo more importantly, centered at 16 by, and, and 16 by 16, together with its uh, uh, skewing capability and efficient st uh, stacking up capability, uh, now we are now ready to use this single architecture, single unified architecture to support all scenarios. For example, for those computing scenarios, let's like smartphone, we, we, we need less computing power and generally always also need less power budget. The cube can be scaled in to 16 by 16 by, by one. So much less computing power, also much less uh, power budget, power, power dissipation. And together with the one instruction set, this flexibility successfully pro provided us with the balance of power, uh, computing power and, and power dissipation. Uh, with multi-precision also supported, 
the most efficient calculation for each different task becomes possible. Becomes, po becomes possible. And given the extremely high density, high computation density, the integrity of power supply becomes also critical when the circuits are running at a full speed. But especially thanks to our picosecond power, uh, current control technology, this extremely uh, critical requirement is met effectively. At the same time, Da Vinci Core has also integrated uh, the ultra-high ultra bit uh, vector processing unit and scalar processing unit inside. This multiple compute design is not only good for calculations other than metrics, but also make this architecture ready for potential change in the future of the types of calculation for new neural networks. And to have, to have a scalable memory, each DaVinci core is equipped with dedicated SROMs, with their function fixed while capacity changeable to adapt to different varied computing power. And all this memory are designed explicitly to low-level software, thus enabling the fine control of data reuse. Okay. For, by further cooperation with the auto tiling plan, finally reaches the perfect balance of computing power and power dissipation. And especially for data center application, the, the on-chip, auto-bandwidth mesh network connects multiple DaVinci calls together with guaranteed low latency, extremely low latency communication between calls and the call with other IPs. And with the help of this four terabyte, four terabytes per second L2 buffer and 1.2 terabytes per second HBM, the performance of this extremely high computer density core are maximized and fully utilized. There's one thing I want to tell you about the chipset Ascend 10. Thanks to our two and a half D packaging technology, the Ascend 910, the chipset, has integrated a die inside, including a die for HBM, compute, and I.O. Thanks to this innovative architecture, as you have seen from Eric's presentation, we now are ready to provide this outstanding energy efficiency across all scenarios, be it extremely low power budget or extremely high computing power required. With this, Ascend, Huawei Ascend series chipset becomes the unique in the world of first all scenario IT and chips for artificial intelligence. On top of our chipset is a layer of CAN, a layer of operators for the chipset. Okay. In this layer, the most important challenge or critical challenge is you always need to trade off, to do trade off between the performance of the operators you develop and the development efficiency. Given the fact of fast deployment and development of AI, we prefer to define our goal as to bring both high efficiency and high performance. First, let's take a look at what's ahead. What's heading? As Eric has said, the published machine learning papers has been growing at the speed of Moore's law since 2009. 80 years. For nowadays, I can share you a story. You know, the annual, annual conference of NIPS, Neural Information Proce Processing System, will be held in Montreal, December this year. You won't believe all its 8,000 seeds were registered within just 10 minutes. Obviously, this lively, active scene will continue in academia. And for, from enterprise perspe perspective, I'd like to share with you the Gartner's idea. Gartner defined a digital disruption scale measured by levels, by five levels, 
is enhance as the first level, extend as the second level, and transform, reinvent, and then revolutionize as the highest level, level five. And accordingly, Gardner suggests in year 2018, or this year, the main impact of artificial intelligence to enterprises is about enhance your current business, enhance your established business. While in just five years' time, the impact of AI will be around transform and reinvent. So obviously, probably, there has never been such a technology that can bring such a huge impact in such a short time, in such a fast way. Put all of them together, we suggest we are entering into an era of dual pro prosperity, both academia and industry. What technically mean for the layer of can, what we are, we are talking about. And it means that we need to be ready for the booming computing operator's diversity. The diversity may come from many aspects. It could be because of different applications, different models, different networks, and different accuracy requirement, and different resource burden, etc. And maybe some many more aspects that aren't known yet. Well, if you look at the, the language that we are using today to develop those operators, they are either good at performance or good performance or good at development efficiency. Obviously, it would be good if we can have a tool, a new tool, that can bring us both, both high performance and high development efficiency. And that's the right motivation of CAN. Computer architecture for neural networks. And here is, Stuart, here is a high level architecture of CAN. The key component of CAN is the highly automated operator development toolkit, the so called Tensor Engine. With Tensor Engine, the compute operator's development generates optimize, optimization and tune can be all. Auto, auto, automatically, all done automatically. And with the one domain-specific domain language interface, the one DSL interface, this Tensor Engine is designed as a beginning to be used both by Huawei develop, developers and non-Huawei developers. With the same tool, we suggest Huawei developers to focus on those operators that need extreme performance while non-Huawei developers may use the same tool to develop whatever you want, and can also support using TVM to develop operators for Ascend Series chipset. And all the operators developed by Huawei can be found in the CCE library. library. CCE means Cube Compute Engine. And so all non-Huawei developers, including you using TVM developed the operators, can be found in CCE lab extension. Uh, take an example to see how powerful it is. This example is an example from Huawei internal operators development project. Reduce sum is a popular operator in TensorFlow. Uh, with command DSL, you need 63 line of codes. And with Tensor Engine, it's just 22. So almost three times greater development efficiency. Then the layer of framework. As for AI framework, no doubt, there is already very crowded. There are a lot of AI frameworks available in the market. But unfortunately, we did not find any of them can fulfill our expectations. And we believe an AI framework should be design time efficient. That means, such as, uh, such as can dramatically reduce uh, the training time and cost. And also need to be long time efficient, such as to use the least amount of resource while deliver the highest energy efficiency. And more importantly, this framework also should be adaptive for different scenarios. It could be cloud, could be edge, could be device, could be anywhere. Okay. 
So first, let's see why. Why such kind of framework should be needed? Let's see what's happening in the game. We believe the future of AI will be highly dynamic. Not only because we noticed the trends mentioned by Michael Jordan. Say, the AI need be supported mission critical, personalized, and across, across other more organizations, etc. And that trend is pushing the frontier of academia research to say, for example, AI in dynamic environment, a secure AI, even this AI specific architecture. But also, but also the continually development in industry. You know, in just six years, according to OpenAI, a computing power required for a single neural network increased 300,000 times. And there are no signals to see any possible slowing down in enterprise. More importantly, GDPR, GDPR has applied to organizations across the world since May 25 this year. What does that mean? Maybe you know, since a long time ago, our human beings, our society, has mastered the intelligence to regulate a lot of assets, to regulate land, to regulate river to regulate spectrum resource, and to regulate all industries we have today. But for data, not yet. And GDPR is the first official comprehensive effort to regulate the data. Obviously, it's not a small step. Its impact is historical. So what technically it mean for the AI framework? It means training or inference will need to be happen anywhere, everywhere. So this is our understanding. So we suggest a AI framework should be a unified training and inference framework that can enable training and inferences anywhere while keep consistent development experience. B it at a device or edge or cloud, be it independent deployed or cooperatively deployed. Be the co cooperation between device and edge or device and cloud or edge and cloud, whatever. And Mindsball is such a kind of all scenario native AI framework that we are developing. The complete Mindsball will be available quarter to next year. And shown here is just uh, the high-level architecture. It includes a model library, graph compute, tuning toolkit, application program interface, and a device edge cloud cooperative distributed architecture for machine learning, deep learning, and reinforcement learning. More importantly, since it's all scenario native, at the very beginning, we design it's minusable to be, to, to be able to either very small or big that can adapt to different scenarios. Well, here is a smaller one, the small one. The own device learning framework, the own device version of Mindsball. Look at those numbers. The total size of the, of the framework is just less than two megabytes. And the required RAM is no more than 50 meg. The required ROM has been reduced five times, comparing with the nearest solution available in the market. And this MySpot, the on device MySpot, will be available quarter one next year. And here is the bigger one. You haven't seen the slide before. By connecting 1,024 Ascend 10 together to a unified computer cluster, the Ascend cluster can give you 256 petaflops computing power. With that, we suggest or we believe you are able to train your model much faster than ever before. And together with this 32 terabyte HBM, if you prefer, now you are ready to create 
a new model, maybe bigger than ever before, but much easier. Okay. The critical challenge for such kind of highly distributed system, the large distributed system, is the acceleration ratio or the linearity, which is always keep declining when the number of nodes involved increase. Knowing that, the higher than 90% linearity that has been verified in our lab tells me, oh my God, my colleagues has done a really good job. Okay, you may be wondering, I already have a lot of trained models. Whether my models can work on ascend chips? The answer is yes. Okay, we have offline generator an offline model generator and offline model engine, all your trained model and your models is to be trained using all major open source frameworks, all supported. Okay, then the last layer, the application enablement layer. We said, or Eric said in her presentation, we need to have a one-stop platform that can change AI from a job of highly skilled expert to a basic skill of every ICT engineer. And that's the main job of this, this layer. So we suggest this layer should be a machine learning path that can facilitate the adoption by AI adoption by enabling this different uh, needs of different level of developers by providing the full pipeline service, hierarchical APIs, and the pre-integrated solutions. First, let's take a look, let's think about how, what's the impact of AI, artificial intelligence, to software application development. It is believed with, with artificial intelligence, as a machine will continually reach and, ex and, and exceed human performance on more and more tasks. So accordingly, artificial intelligence will gradually redefine software application development by replacing these tasks and more and more tasks which were developed in traditional way. So, for a long time, the software application will be composed of, of two parts, the trad traditional software parts and the AI software parts. Well, these two parts are so different in terms of their development, task, and maintain. Actually, for the AI part, it needs a bunch of services, as you will hear, all the way from acquired data, model training, model management, deployment, and maintain, which I said, adapt to change. And generally, this bunch of services are always isolated, and some of them even unavailable. At this moment, this AI part always asks the highly skilled experts data scientists, which are also generally unavailable. As a consequence, the whole application and solution development of AI becomes challenging. The piece of AI adoption is blocked. Knowing that, our application enablement layer aims to make this AI part as simple as possible. One of, one of the key services we announced today is Model Us, which is a full, full pipeline model production oriented services. It can provide you all services you need from acquiring data and to deploy and to adapt change. There's a bunch of services. I only, I only, I only want to point two points, or I have two points here today. One is the adapt to change. Maybe you know the performance deterioration of a trained model is inevitable. So for enterprise, it's, it becomes extremely important to monitor performance continually and to make those change before you must. There are five subservices being developed for this job. Monitoring, keep, help, help you to monitor the system. I don't want to mention that, listen it here. And the second point, the second service I want to access here is so-called XML. And here it is. 
motivated by the largest distributed training system, we suggest the machine learning automation is able to see its new horizon. Beyond the traditional machine learning op op uh, automation solutions that we who focused on just uh, network uh, model construction automation and optimization procedure op uh, optimization, XML at the beginning include a deployment scenario awareness into its op automation. That means XML, as its name means, is aims at a execution-oriented automa automatic model generation and optimization, while adapt to different, your different, varied deployment scenario, be it the cloud, edge, or device. This XML becomes the first such kind of system that can give you the optimum performance and the minimal cost by design from the beginning. And more details can be found tomorrow. Said. And there's one thing I believe is worth to emphasize. Our full stack solution is not a closed solution, but the open architecture-based architecture -based open solution. The cloud AI do support GPU as well, beyond Ascend. OK. As AI is still in its early stage, so pre-integrated solutions becomes quite helpful to ease to facilitate AI adoption. Even just one year past since we launched our cloud AI, we are ready to provide such rich pre-integrated solutions. AI solutions for manufacturing, for campus, for logistics, and many things. More importantly, I want to share with you is, according to our work experience, when working with our customers, and also when we are developing these uh, pre-integrated solutions, we feel strongly or confident to say, digital twin, you may know very well, a popular term, is something going to be legacy. While intelligent, intelligent twins, with all you need for cloud, for edge, and device, has become a new normal. We also have the pre-integrated solutions for a pre primary cloud environment, infused in mind of full-stack software of AI, an atlas of dedicated uh, artificial intelligence or into the server. Put, put them together, we now have four appliances for you. Appliances for training, appliances for video analysis, appliances for offset enforcement, and for OCR, OCR. Okay, in summary, we believe to facilitate AI adoption, to make AI pervasive, the solutions should be all scenario native. And with our all scenario native full stack AI solutions, we believe we are ready to enable all your organizations to be AI powered. And together with you, we believe we can drive or we are driving AI to its new horizons. Please join us. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Dan Wenxuan. And now, let's invite Dr. Vishal Sika to share his speech. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. And welcome to Huawei Connect. The event, the buzz here is all about AI. It is amazing, amazing to see this. Um, you see the future um, that we are looking at with intelligent systems. So I want to take some time this morning to build on Eric and, and Wenchuan's talk and talk to you about the great waves that are ahead of us, the waves of intelligent systems, the waves of artificial intelligence. And how do we ride these waves? How do we not only not let these waves become disruptors to us, but indeed have the fun, have the achievement of riding the great wave ahead. Eric briefly talked about this. AI has been around for a long time. In fact, 
humanity's fascination with intelligent systems goes back centuries. But the field of artificial intelligence started uh, in 1956, uh, led by these two gentlemen, Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy, at a famous conference in, in Dartmouth. And in the early days, in the first couple of decades of AI, a lot of breakthrough work happened. And you see some examples here. The uh, gentleman here in the middle is Arthur Samuel, who wrote the first machine learning program that was using machine learning to play checkers, to play Go. You know, a couple of years ago, when AlphaGo defeated the world champion of, uh, of Go, there was big news. But indeed, Arthur Samuel had built a Go, uh, machine learning program to play Go in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Right next to that, you see the first mobile robot called Shaky that was built at, uh, at Stanford and SRI. Um, and below that, you see a picture of uh, Marvin Minsky's own PhD thesis. This was one of the first neural networks. It was a neural network, physical neural network, built before transistor technology uh, called SNARK, which was, used to, which was using neural networks to solve maze puzzles. Uh, and of course, on the furthest right is uh, Frank Rosenblatt's original perceptrons implementation, also in the 1950s. And then these two papers are papers that I wrote. Uh, the first one is a paper that I wrote um, when I was an intern at Intel's Artificial Intelligence Lab in the early 90s. And the last one uh, is my own PhD thesis, a one page from that. Uh, my thesis was, uh, my PhD thesis in AI at Stanford was in integrating specialized procedures like neural networks and other specialist reasoners into a logic-based proof system. So in the early days of AI, there was a lot of focus on breadth, on broad application of AI, and the representational aspects of AI, to be able to represent concepts using AI. And Eric referred to this. There were a couple of uh, AI winters that followed where a lack of success in AI led to some disillusionment, some disappointment. But in the last five years, we have seen tremendous interest uh, driven by some breakthrough achievements. And there are many examples of these achievements here. Uh, you see facial recognition done at very, very wide scale. This is a picture of a level four autonomous vehicle that Baidu just launched. Um, I took a picture of uh, today's uh, squad 2.0 leaderboard and uh, uh, natural language processing systems are routinely now able to come close to human performance. Even in uh, squad 2.0 is a natural language benchmark. Uh, the original squad benchmark um, had human performance. That was a simpler benchmark, but the human performance in that was already routinely exceeded by autonomous systems, natural language processing systems. So now the squad two auto benchmark is a more sophisticated reading comprehension benchmark. And already again we see uh, uh, systems, and there is a paper from Microsoft Research, and Dr. Hang will talk right after me, uh, about how um, natural language processing systems are now able to get close to human performance. So there is a tremendous interest, a tremendous set of achievements that have happened in the last five years, and these are a result of three factors. And the first one is advances in some techniques, primarily based on neural networks. And I showed you an example of Rosenblatt's perceptrons that was built in the 1950s. The deep neural networks, which are massive in size, augmented by techniques like convolutional neural networks, for vision and image processing and uh, reinforcement neural networks, recurrent neural networks based on, that are used for speech and, and language processing. These have led to some breakthrough results, but really the results are also as much a factor of the massive improvement in computing capacity that has happened over the last few decades. The uh, computers today, and Eric talked about this chip on the Ascend Max chip with 256 teraflops of operation. This is unthinkable. Probably when Rosenblatt built his perceptron, 
the entire world's computing capacity put together was not 256 teraflops. Um, and so this combination of the advances in techniques, the advances in computing, and the availability of large amounts of data has led to a lot of these breakthrough achievements in artificial intelligence in the last, I would say, five or six years. And that has led to a, a huge set of opportunities. Today, there are several thousand startup companies funded by billions of dollars in venture capital that are addressing different parts of the overall AI spectrum. And within the enterprise as well, when we think about this, we realize that the, every single industry can go through a significant transformation led by AI in every industry. Um, customer engagement, our ability to understand what customers are doing, to engage with what customers are doing, can be dramatically transformed using AI. Indeed, AI can be the eyes, the ears, the voice of an enterprise to the customer. And in the back office, significant operational efficiency, operational simplification and automation can be achieved by using AI from simplifying many of the core processes which are labor intensive um, to in asset in heavy industries, um, simplifying the tasks of maintenance, asset maintenance, predictive maintenance, being able to bring a dramatic new efficiency to that. If you think about the oil and gas industry, for example, the task of upstream exploration, uh, efficient and uh, less uh, disruptive exploration can be dramatically enhanced using AI, where you are uh, analyzing massive amounts of data coming from seismic uh, data generation. And today there are thousands of physicists and mathematicians who analyze data coming from uh, these seismic events to understand where the oil or where the gas is. This process can be dramatically amplified and simplified using AI. And similarly, the act of exploration, once you have identified the, um, uh, where the resources are, then the act of exploring and digging and, and uh, getting to that, the execution of that, can be simplified with AI. And of course, the task of maintaining complex machinery in remote areas uh, can be dramatically improved by using uh, AI techniques. We all know about consumer applications, but in every single industry, these kinds of applications exist. And yet, despite all this interest, and despite all this excitement and opportunity, there are still significant and structural limitations that we see in AI technology. When Shuan talked about this, these are still the early days, and despite decades of work, we are still in the early stages of AI, and there are significant limitations that are still in front of us. We see lots of examples, um, some famous examples that have happened recently of autonomous driving not quite um, doing its job, famous examples of uh, misidentification and mislabeling and so forth. There in the middle, there is a very interesting paper that was just published. Uh, it's called The Elephant in the Room, where the authors actually put a picture of an elephant inside a room, and then dropping a picture of an elephant changes the identification of all the objects that are in this, in this picture. And of course, as humans, we can immediately recognize that there is an elephant in this room, and uh, it is impossible for there to be an elephant in this room. And yet, of course, these uh, neural systems don't have a way to model the world in this way, to understand the semantics of the world in this way. I mentioned earlier that in the early days, AI used to be a lot more about representation and about inference. Uh, even though we have seen dramatic progress in the last few years, we have actually not quite cracked many of these fundamental problems around being able to understand, articulate, and reason about the world. And these are essential qualities for enterprise AI. So when we look, about, when we look at the, uh, the emerging stack uh, for AI in the enterprise, we see three distinct layers. We see the hardware, where Moore's law 
which has been the guiding force behind the development of hardware over the last 52 or 53 years, has now more or less come to a stop. I was uh, uh, reading this interview with David Patterson, who won the Turing Award last year, where we talked about the fact that if Moore's Law was still continuing, we would be a factor of 15 ahead of where we are. So in the last few years, Moore's Law has significantly slowed down. And the slowdown of Moore's Law has led to the opportunity to build new kinds of hardware, domain-specific hardware, AI-specific hardware, to continue the dramatic advances. Um, and then around that, the availability of systems and cloud is creating an opportunity to build AI-specific hardware systems. And the layer above this is the layer of software, where you have two distinct uh, categories. The engines, like, like TensorFlow or CAFE or MXNet and so forth, PyTorch, and the layer above that of the developer experience or the platform and the tools and the software ecosystems. And then finally, the top is the layer of AI applications and AI services. And when we look at the opportunities and the gaps in this stack, we see that while there is tremendous opportunity, and a simple way to look at the opportunity is, we have the opportunity to transform enterprises in every industry via a really great enterprise AI platform that would deliver a seamless developer experience to build multifaceted enterprise class applications on an underlying hardware platform that would deliver a full stack experience that was integrated and yet open and high performing. That continues to be the great opportunity. But when I think about the current reality against this stack, we still see that there are significant gaps. When it comes to services and application building, there is a lot of, I mentioned earlier, thousands of startups. And they're all, many of them are building, most of them are building applications. But these applications are still scratching the surface of what is possible. The applications are not connected. They are not, they are point solutions. They are not um, interconnected. They are not interoperable. They are not a part of a shared common platform. There is still a massive shortage of AI talent. As we speak today, there are maybe 300,000 trained machine learning engineers in the world. And this number needs to be in the tens of millions in the time ahead. The availability of services is still quite weak. Long-term mature AI con uh, enterprise concepts like lifecycle management are still not there in the AI stack. And when we think about the developer experience, the developer experience today is quite it's quite broken. There are many frameworks and, and engines. I mentioned some of them. But our ability to build an application today is still very fragmented. I have tried to do this myself. I have observed developers building applications, going from identifying the problem, finding the sponsors, getting the budget, getting the governance right, to getting the data, making sure the data is labeled, making sure there is governance around the data, making sure that the data is secure, its lineage is well established, cleansing it, and so forth. Getting the hardware, hardware is a crucial issue. And Eric alluded to this in his speech. There are huge differences in price performance when we make hardware choices. On the one hand, we have elasticity that we need in order to scale our delivery of AI systems up and down. And on the other hand, we have the cost performance. Performance can be dramatically different depending on what kind of a hardware choice we make. And then that is at sometimes at odds with openness because making a cloud choice gets us locked in to that cloud choice. So how do we navigate when it comes to hardware, this choice between elasticity on the one hand, the price performance on the other hand, and openness on the third hand. And then once we have done that, is the actual task of building the application, identifying the software tools, finding the experts, trying out the tools, getting around the fact that many of these tools are still opaque 
they are not transparent, they are not explainable. We have to understand, are we doing the right thing? Are we going to, under the right circumstances, be able to use the right tools? And then finally, lifecycle management. Once we have built and deployed the application, how will it survive? Um, how will it evolve as the data evolves, as our business process evolves, as the uh, data sources evolve, as people leave, how do we transfer the knowledge of what is inside this system? So we need an AI platform that has the ability to deliver a seamless experience across these kinds of steps. And today we don't have that. And of course, finally, the hardware, I already talked about it. Again, there we have this trade-off between the elasticity on the one hand, the price performance on the other hand. So what we really need for the times ahead to deliver the full potential of AI is a partner that can help us think, that can help us deliver this kind of a full stack across the six layers and deliver both on the one hand the economics, but on the other hand the performance and the flexibility. Can we go to the next slide, please? So we need a new approach. We need a, a new partner who can help us understand and ride these great waves. Can we go to the next slide, please? A partner who can help us understand, who, who understands the business and the enterprise complexity. A partner who on the one hand understands AI and what it can mean for us in the enterprise and can deal with the rapid evolution of the field that is going to happen in the near future. Who understands the limitations of the technology as well as the opportunities and can translate that into solutions. Who can deliver these solutions across the stack, a full stack solution, and the cost performance of the full stack solution to help us deliver an enlightened enterprise. I was really happy to see, I was looking forward to seeing um, what Huawei has to announce today, and I was very happy to see the announcement of on the one hand the SN microprocessor that is the first AI specific um, chip that Huawei has released, and uh, the incredible performance and the AI native as well as the CAN programming model on top of this to build uh, optimizations. Uh, you know, Python code, a lot of AI applications are written in Python. We can actually deliver a thousand times improvement in Python execution by optimizing it uh, into the AI hardware. And then, of course, the MindSpore libraries for building uh, AI applications, and then the model arts programming model and the developer framework uh, for a great developer that is integrated, I believe that Huawei has done a wonderful job in creating such an open stack as well as a full stack experience across the board. People often ask me, what is the future of enterprises with AI? What, is the, what happens to jobs? What happens to the skills issues and so forth? And my own sense is that if you look back over the last several decades, as well as even before that, going up to the Industrial Revolution, about how automation has helped us transform ourselves using, using these automation, using these tools. I think an enterprise can achieve a same kind of benefit by the use of automation, by the use of intelligence by the use of AI. As systems become more intelligent, enterprises can become more enlightened. AI can help us focus and find our own wisdoms much more effectively by taking away the things that can be well-defined, that can be well-prescribed, and automating those. We are free to pursue our own unique wisdom, to pursue our humanity. And the same thing applies to enterprises. In enterprises, intelligent systems go hand in hand with the enterprise's ability 
to become intelligent, to become enlightened, and go a step beyond, uh, beyond being intelligent, into delivering our own creativity, our own innovations, our own ability to invent the future. I think AI, like any great technology, like any powerful technology, can be a disruptive force, or it can be a great force for helping us improve our future. It can be a, a force for us to help us um, a wonderful way to build our products and solutions, to serve our markets, to serve our customers. And it is that purposeful AI that I am interested uh, in pursuing. I believe that in the times ahead, AI is going to offer a great set of new waves and just like in surfing, when we see a great wave, we can either get wiped out by it or we can learn to ride it. In fact, hang 10 uh, refers to the act of hanging, our, hanging 10 toes over the surfboard, meaning learning to ride a wave so smoothly, so efficiently, so effectively that we have the freedom to actually put our toes on top of the board and hang 10. And, uh, I hope that at this Huawei Connect, uh, you are able to really learn about all the different AI solutions and technologies that can help us to ride a hang 10 on the great waves ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vishal Sika. Now, please welcome Dr. Xiao Wen Hong to share his views. Dear guests, uh, good morning. It's my great honor to take the next 20 minutes to share with you Microsoft's uh, vision and strategy of AI. You may all know that the reason we are discussing about AI here today is from digitalization to PC to IoT, Everything is digital. With digitalization, everything can generate data, and data increases significantly. Now we have uh, big data. Today we're in 2020. Your behavior every day, the things you do every day, and your experience, everything will be translated into data with this massive amount of data and with AI and the powerful algorithms, we can do a lot of um, exciting and powerful applications. Microsoft is similar as Huawei. We are a platform company. We have an exciting vision because we have cloud and uh, device, and we have intelligent cloud and intelligent edge. The interactions happen in the edge, but a lot of intelligence uh, is achieved through the cloud. We say that we need to train the AI uh, models, and that needs to happen in the cloud. So what is Microsoft's vision. In a science fiction, you may see the conflict between AI and human beings, but we think AI is going to amplify human ingenuity. We can also infuse AI and make AI available to everyone. So mankind can spend your time more wisely and enjoy the interactions with uh, human being. So we say that AI is to help people and to amplify human ingenuity. Take myself as ex example. I've moved uh, apartments for two times in one year. I could not remember my uh, 
fix the nine uh, phone number. It's because it's not because I don't have a good memory. It's because I don't need to do it because uh, uh, the tool can do it for me. With big data and AI, we can uh, have uh, translation, voice recognition uh, functions, and it can also enable us to have uh, intelligent interactions. And more importantly, after we collect in data, we can make decisions, and that is about reasoning. Microsoft is a platform company. Our vision is to use our platform to help our partners and enterprises to embed AI into their products and services. Microsoft is just a platform in the ecosystem. But in this way, we can make AI available to everyone. And this is the way that Microsoft can make the greatest contribution to the world. Talking about platform, recently a lot of people are talking about AI. I think in China, there is the ABC concept, and I like it very much. Before AI is possible, you need to have uh, big computing. Currently, a lot of computing tasks are done on the cloud, and some are done in the edge. AI needs a large GPU, and deep learning also requires large uh, computing power. So this is a C. And B, uh, currently AI is based upon big data, and B stands for big data. Before AI is possible, you must have B and C, big data and computing power. And that is what we can offer through the platform. Huawei's speakers also mentioned that uh, uh, chipset, uh, hardware, uh, servers, and then OS, and some uh, middleware. These belong to the computing platform. Above that, it is the data platform. It can process structured data. Uh, we have structured data database and also non-structured data. Uh, Hadoop and Spark, they provide data lake. And then how to uh, interact structured and non-structured data. Then we have a float data and streaming data from the edge. With data, you need to store them and also you need to process them, and then you can conduct data mining. In addition to that, you may do statistics and uh, make them visible. You need to conduct big data analytics before you have AI applications. Above that, you can have uh, machine learning, deep learning, AI uh, frameworks. Above that, you will uh, conduct experiments and debug, and then you may release it as a product or service. For any company to utilize AI to uh, go digital, they need such a platform. Microsoft is very similar to Huawei. We hope that in our system, ecosystem, we can provide a platform to empower every company to easily embed AI into their products and services. I'm responsible for R&D of uh, Microsoft in Asia Pacific, and I'm also responsible for the uh, Microsoft Research Asia. And this year is the 20th anniversary of our research institute. And this is also the uh, 40th anniversary of Chinese reforming and opening up. So it's a very exciting time point. In terms of fundamental uh, research, uh, Microsoft is growing together with China. To the future, uh, we're also working on the technology transfer. We've developed uh, a lot of uh, teams. Early November, we will have a celebration 
of uh, our anniversary. There are a lot of activities by then. Please stay tuned. In terms of our research focus areas in Asia Pacific, our research center is also the biggest. And in terms of the very important technologies for the future, we focus on them such as natural user interface, artificial intelligence, intelligent multimedia, big data, cloud computing, intelligent cloud, intelligent ad. And finally, what I would like to say is that for the entire IT industry, the rapid development relies on fundamental research, among which AI is a very important case in point. And here, at this occasion, I would like to emphasize that AI has at least a history of 62 years. Microsoft participated in AI research for about 30 years with the initiation of a Microsoft Research Institute. And we understand the importance of fundamental research. Microsoft and Huawei hope to encourage more enterprises to do research in the fundamental level of AI so that it can lay a solid foundation for a bright future of AI application and for the entire people's well-being. Recently, we have made some AI breakthroughs, and I would like to share with you about those. There are some important technology domains, such as vision, speech, and natural language. In computer vision, ResNet is a frequently used indicator where we see breakthroughs. For the first time on ImageNet, the computer vision capability has gone beyond that of mankind. ResNet is the deep learning model that everyone uses in computer vision. AlphaGo, which we are all very familiar with, also utilize ResNet to beat the human champion, then speech. In our Asia Pacific Research Center, we work with the American colleagues on a very important task called switchboard. And for the first time, we have reached human parity. Machine translation, a very hot topic. In October this year, we also matched human performance in translating news from Chinese to English. And there's a very important and also challenging domain called natural language comprehension. And in plain English, reading comprehension, it means that after you read a segment of articles, you need to answer the questions with the understanding of the text. I think we all have this kind of experiences when we take English texts, and it is difficult for us to have a high level of reading comprehension. In the beginning of this year, for the first time, our exam result also reached human parity with a very high level of exact match before October 1st. In F1, the impartial comprehension part, we also exceeded human parity. I believe that with our focus and our attention on AI domains, there will be more breakthroughs in the future. AI can help us with understanding language, better vision, and uh, clearer speech. We can also use data from different domains to deliver digital transformation. Normally, we see the top right corner part, namely transforming your products. In the past, we call it Internet Plus. Today, it may be called as AI Plus, but I think it's just ABC Plus. Like if you have big data computation and AI technologies, you're able to transform your products and services. I think this is a commonly discussed topic. The other three areas are somewhat less discussed. 
But this is where we can show our core competence. First, capability to engage with your customers. If the customer has some issues or difficulties, you need to help them to resolve those, and we call it intelligent agent. And more importantly, how can we put these potential customers as a part of our marketing team? Whether it's a 2B or 2C company, it needs this kind of capability so as to have better customer relationship. Let's look at the lower right part. Whether you focus on sales or R&D, it is very important for you to have more efficient operations cost. And a lot of the companies are discussing how we can realize that through the ABC technologies. And last but not least, empowering your employees. I think at the very end, the value of the company is its employees. Only people can come up with new ideas, new strategies. How can we use these A, B, and C technologies? Well, we need to empower our employees so that they can do a good job not only at work but also at home. Sometimes you have some family emergency; you have to rush back. And when that happens, how can you use A, B, C technologies to make the employees more efficient to deal with such situations? And more importantly, here we have computing, big data, and AI. How can we motivate employees' ingenuity so that they can come up with new ideas? In this way, the company will be more competent. I think this is a very important direction. Microsoft in China works with its partners, including Huawei, on how our customers. And partners can be offered better services. Today, we are exploring the digital transformation as a service. I understand that you come from different backgrounds. Some technologies may be understood differently among yourself, but I think first of all, the consulting service is very important, and that's why we. Established our MSRA Innovation Partnership, so that we can communicate between companies. In particular, Microsoft can discuss with the other companies about our products and, most importantly, technologies, and also future technologies. Like in one, three, or five years of time, what will the future technologies be? With that understanding and that insight, the companies will do a better job in digital transformation, as they can have a multiple-year planning. Apart from building a platform, Microsoft welcomes our partners and other companies to utilize our platform for digital transformation. However, some other companies also hope Microsoft. Can help them with the last mile, the industry innovation. Because of that, we work with our strategic partners in this domain. Let me give you some examples. First, intelligent logistics with OOCL. In the past summer, I worked with Pasco, and. With the reinforcement learning, which is cooperative, we find ways to better arrange the containers that are vacant, because it is very important for us to reduce the empty container time. During our first phase cooperation, we utilize this cooperative reinforcement learning AI technology to reduce 10 million US dollars in terms of cost. And with the second phase up and coming, there will be more cost reduced. Another example is about education. In China, 
we see that learning English is most efficient when we are really learning from a tutor. However, if we're not able to have this face-to-face -face learning experience, then we can think of something else. Here, we have developed a robot that can communicate with you, that can keep scoring you, giving you feedback about your pronunciation, intonation, word choices, and at the same time, the agent can help you note down the difficulties you have in learning English. And the next time when you go to a classroom, the teacher would know instantly what kind of issues or difficulties you have. You may have heard about Longman Dictionary. We now work with Longman, and in the very near future, for every Longman textbook, there will be a corresponding English learning robot so that we are able to be more efficient in learning English in the future. So this is another example of how we work with our partners. Finally, about the corporate social responsibility. We understand that there are some anxieties about AI technologies, like would be controlled by very few people in the future, will AI compete against people in the future, or will AI lead to data bias and other problems, or even will AI replace most of the jobs? Microsoft has been active in many domains, and we are proud to say that we welcome more people from the industry from the government to participate in dialogues to drafting the AI-related rules and regulations so that AI will not only be pervasive but also be doing good things, ensuring fairness, eliminating bias, protecting our privacy, and so on and so forth and we call it AI ethic, or AI for partnership. The essence of those concepts is to let people trust AI more. Today, I understand that the audience are the technology enthusiasts, but some people do not know about these technologies. When we talk about using an AI technology or other technology to change the world, we need to ensure that this technology is trustworthy, it's regulated. That's the only way. A lot of the high-tech companies think that the rules are unnecessary as it will impede innovation. However, Microsoft thinks that rules are very important because if we're able to have some fair, open, and equal rules, it will put us on the same footing. Otherwise, without rules, some may start very early and some tend to be conservative as they wait till others have started. Instead, we hope that this kind of AI rules can put us on an equal footing so we can start together. And eventually, it will be better for the mankind, for our welfare. Therefore, Microsoft's goal is to ensure AI empowers us all, that we can try to eliminate all the related negative impacts. We're very happy that today Huawei is holding this Huawei Connect conference, and uh, we are very honored to work with Huawei on our platforms, respectively. 
at Microsoft Inspire and Microsoft Tech Summit, Huawei has also provided us with tremendous support. And finally, I would like to make a little advertisement here. This is the QR code you're seeing. If you scan it, you're able to sign to the Microsoft website to learn about our latest AI development. At the same time, two weeks from now, namely at the end of October, our Microsoft Tech Summit will be held here in Shanghai in this Expo Center where we will launch our latest products and offerings. And we hope that you can also join our summit by then. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Dr. Xiao Wenhong, for your insights. Many thanks to all of our speakers for their inspiring speeches, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Over the next two days, we will continue to explore more exciting topics together. 感谢所有精彩的演讲。至此，华为发第一天的主题大会已经接近尾声。在未来的两天中，更多的精彩话题将逐步展开。Here's a preview of tomorrow's keynote event. 您将看到明天大会的精彩预告，敬请期待。